done. Learn from companies that are successful in the market and discover the local. Uh, Australia's global university and um, I find in my role as the airport economist uh, I find myself being in I think about 60 countries in the last five years so uh, I go to every country I think for about three days and uh, people uh, ask me what I think of Brazil or China or Colombia or Papua New Guinea and I say, well, I only really went to the airport, but here's, here's what I think. So it sort of became the title, the, Air, the Airport Economist. But I've got to say that uh, in some ways it's better than the alternative. When I was a, a graduate student in the United States, I had a, um, a, a fellow a graduate student who won the John Bates Clark Medal for the best economist under 40. And his special subject was fertility in Indian villages. And I used to say to him, wow, you must go to India a lot to do your research and so on. He said, no, I've never been to India. I get the data from the World Bank. In fact, I've never left the United States. I don't have a passport. And uh, I was quite shocked by this. So I thought it was better to be an airport economist than an armchair economist. Now, um, I have a confession to make. I, when I was recently in uh, South America, um, I was in Argentina and they complained that um, Brazil had won too many World Cups. I think Brazil's won about five and Argentina's only won about two. And uh, they said, could you make it up for us? So I fixed them up with a Pope. So when it comes to Popes, Argentina's won, Brazil nil. And in return, I had to make a, a quick confession before I uh, gave my talk today. And the confession is, is I will use a lot of slides. Um, economists are mad on slides and graphics. Uh, me, I'm a slide junkie. They send me to California to go into rehab, but I still come back and have to show you lots of slides. So that's my first confession. Uh, the, the second one is I have a very aristocratic name, Harcourt. It sounds very French. When I go to the OECD, they say, oh, Monsieur Harcourt, your usual place. Um, there's a Chateau d'Arcourt in the north of France, and I spend my European summers there pretending I'm a, a relative. Uh, but the confession is, is that I'm not a real Harcourt. My ancestors were called Harkovitz. They were from Transylvania. And you probably think Transylvania, Dracula, economist, bloodsucker, it all makes sense. Um, my uh, my great-grandfather um, was actually training to be a rabbi, but he was an atheist, so he wasn't going very well in his career. Um, he tried to join the Bondi... Uh, surf club in Sydney as Harkovitz uh, 100 years ago and when he came as Harkovitz they sort of said well listen mate we don't really uh, need you but when he changed his name by Depol to Harcourt and came back the next week they said great mate we need lots of lysos in you go so we've been Harcourt ever since and I actually got a bit upset because I thought Harkovitz was a good name for a Nobel Prize winning economist because there was Harry Markovitz so it was one letter off, it's pretty close. And so I used to say to my grandpa, why did you change our name? And he said, I didn't change our name, I just left the Goldbergs so I could join the Icebergs. And that's why we've been, uh, we've been hardcore ever since. Um, now, I do, I do travel a lot um, uh, as the airport economist. I'm going to talk a little bit today about different parts of the world that I travel to, uh, what it means for China and what it means for Australia and our relationship and how we then impose the age of Trump over that. So I'll start with the world. I tend to start a lot in Southeast Asia. And when you think of Southeast Asia and its importance to Australia, it's had big changes in the last 12 months. We've had uh, uh, the death of the king in, in, in Thailand, very important to the Thai people. We've had uh, a very difficult election in Jakarta for, for the governor, uh, a new presidential election in, uh, in, in the Philippines, and then uh, some interesting developments in Malaysia. And despite a lot of the flux in Southeast Asia, when you ask small businesses in the surveys we do uh, at the University of New South Wales, most of them still, though, have a go to Southeast Asia and to China as their first port of call. Very, very important uh, to their markets. I'm a great beneficiary of ties with Southeast Asia. When I was at Adelaide University uh, in the last, uh, last century, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the grand old man of Singapore, sent all these guys from Singapore who went to go to Oxford to do nuclear physics, he sent them all to Adelaide to do economics. 
So in my class, 90% of my class was from Singapore and Malaysia. And as a result, I got very good grades and became a chief economist. So I was a great beneficiary uh, from higher education. And you can see that today at our university, uh, at the University of New South Wales. So Southeast Asia is very important economically, very important in terms of education ties. In Northeast Asia, we've of course got Arbonomics, uh, the three arrows, uh, trying to work hard. Japan has difficulty uh, in terms of its economies. It's re really quite a domestic focused economy. I think there's around 100 Australian companies in Japan, while well, there'd be over 3,000 in China, just to show you how relatively insular Japan is as an economy. They also have some demographic challenges. They say that um, China's running out of wives. Well, Japan is running out of husbands. They've got a, 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 an ageing population that is uh, creating great challenges for them. In Northeast Asia too, uh, South Korea. This is South Korea in the 1950s. Uh, this is Seoul. And you can see Seoul today, quite a remarkable transformation uh, of its economy. And, uh, and Bob Carr was also mentioning that extraordinary story. Korea's been a great mate of Australia. You could say we're soulmates. Uh, in terms of APEC, G20, and the Korean-Australian Free Trade Agreement. Very, very important to Australia, and I'll be in Seoul uh, next week, so I'll be seeing how that's going. I, too, have some good soulmates in Korea, uh, as you can see. Uh, uh, by, by accident, my books got into that uh, slide, which I didn't mean to. China and India in the region. Interesting in terms of economic history. Um, I wrote a piece for The Age about education uh, with China and India and Australia and of course the great cartoonist Spooner uh, drew it as the, the great mining boom, the, uh, the dragon elephant falling in, into our lap. We talk about the emergence of China and India but when you look at economic history back to when Moses was in, in short pants, you can see that China and India, those brown and pink bars, were the dominant economies until the 17th century. So it's not an emergence, it really is a re-emergence of two very important economies in the world. Part of this has been urbanisation. Um, uh, like most of you, I go to China and I might be in Shanghai and some people will say, are you going to the country towns? Little country towns, Chengdu, Chongqing, uh, cities of a mere 15, 33 million, these little country towns in China, that urbanisation played a very, very, mu very much important role in Australia. When I was last in Chengdu, I met a landscape architect from Brisbane. He was doing Italian Renaissance gardens, landscape gardens in Brisbane. Everyone in Brisbane, in Queensland, had one. So he moved his whole office to Chengdu, where that was where most of his custom came with the great urbanisation of China, the bright lights, big city. Also, um, again, uh, in Chengdu and, and in Beijing, Australian architects have been great beneficiaries of the urbanisation boom. This is the Great Mall of China uh, in Chengdu that we were there for with the University of New South Wales, with the AGSM ABA, MBA uh, course I teach, and of course the water cube at the Beijing Olympics built by an architect here in Sydney. The design is very much part of that, part of that relationship. India, well, there was a time where we said, where the bolly, how are you? Because Australian businesses did not go to India. But now India's had its own boom and its own emergence with important matching uh, of GDP uh, with China and also lagging China in the, in the export stakes, but very important in terms of, of services. And in fact, my first visit uh, to India uh, officially was when Bob Carr was the Premier of, of New South Wales and on my first day Bob's uh, staff kindly gave me all his cricket tickets so I saw Tendorka bat on his home ground and I interviewed uh, Arasha Rao who was Miss Universe so I thought India was a pretty good place for my, my, my first day there. We're now seeing of course Modi Mania and the Make in India program that's having a great impact on infrastructure in, in India. Now I go to other parts of Central Asia that, uh, that, that Bob mentioned. I spend a fair bit of time in uh, Mongolia. I, I found that interesting place. 
everything's named after Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, the airport, the vodka, the beer. Um, they told me in Mongolia that Chinggis Khan was the father of free trade. When he conquered Asia Minor, he brought down tariffs. Now, I thought he was the father of lots of things, but free trade, I didn't know. I always thought it was uh, David Ricardo. And also in Mongolia, many Mongolians, the Speaker of the House, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, are educated in Australia. And they're called the Mongolian Australian Association, the Mozzies, and they're very, very influential. Uh, from Mongolia, I spent a lot of time in Kazakhstan. Now, um, before I went to Kazakhstan, I only knew about uh, Borat. And in fact, I went to London uh, as advisor to Jay Weatherall, the Premier of South Australia. We went to an alumni function, but it was in the same building in Festival Hall as Sasha Baron Cohen's new film, The Dictator, at the time. And I went up to him and said, oh, I'm going to Kazakhstan next week. And he said, you must see my friend Borat. He is a journalist there. And I did go to Kazakhstan to a Nobel Prize conference and the only person who uh, wasn't uh, from Kazakhstan and uh, or wasn't didn't have a Nobel Prize was myself and Tony Blair. He was the other speaker. And I told him how I'd just been to London and I'd met Borat and uh, uh, I was from Australia. He was very excited about Australia because he had very strong ties with the Australian Labor Party and uh, Jeff Gallup in particular. And he said, so let's tell me, let's, let's get this straight. You went all the way to London to meet Borat and all the way to Kazakhstan to meet Tony Blair. What an unusual life you, life you have. <laughs> Africa, um, I spend a lot of time in, uh, uh, in South Africa. In fact, when I worked for the ACTU, uh, we supported the anti-apartheid movement and I was sent over to work for Nelson Mandela when he became president of uh, the new South Africa. I was very nervous when I went there. They said, uh, would you like a cup of coffee? And I didn't want to say black or white, so I said, oh, with milk, thanks, you know, and they said, it's OK, uh, it's, it's not a test. And um, Mandela said to me, never forget Africa, never forget South Africa now that apartheid's over. So I often go back. Uh, in fact, um, I remembered Mandela's words and I got to South Africa in 2010 and I didn't know the World Cup for football was on and I had to go for Bafana Bafana. So that just was a, a coincidence. Um, I go a bit to, to Europe. Uh, there's been a lot of Europhobia. We're trying to make way for some Eurovision. You've noticed in economics now, there's a lot of popular culture that takes economic terms. There's a lot of films about economics. Uh, they're the big short uh, about the, uh, the global financial crisis. There's a new film coming out. It's called um, My Big Fat Greek Debt uh, in uh, cinemas soon. And you can see uh, the impact of that debt, uh, basically very hard to tell a German factory worker who's 77 working in the snow in Dusseldorf to pay the pension of a Greek public servant who's 51 in the sun in, in Athens. So that's quite a, quite a challenge. And now, of course, we have Brexit and, uh, and a general election in the UK where um, Jeremy Corbyn could make Michael Foote look charismatic and electorally appealing, so quite something to go by. Across the Atlantic, the North America went from the subprime to the ridiculous. But having said that, the labour market in America is improving. Uh, Janet Yellen's actually done a very good job at uh, uh, in improving the labour market. And when we do our surveys at the University of New South Wales and we ask people where they will be in five years' time, they still see the US as an important source of investment, of growth, of technology, and particularly in terms of research and development and collaborations in, in universities. When I look to America, I often look to Latin America as much as North America. In fact, um, I wrote a book with the Lowy Institute called Great Southern Lands about Australia and Brazil, and I actually had Bob Carr as foreign minister launch uh, that book just before the uh, World Cup and the Olympics uh, by coincidence. And the other Latin American countries got so jealous of Brazil's prominence that they asked me to write another book. And uh, I had to, sorry, Bob, I'd ask Julie Bishop to launch that book uh, to keep it bipartisan. And that book covered the rest of Latin America, uh, the Inca Strikes Back in Peru, Red Hot Chili Peppers, the world with free trade agreements about Chile, don't buy from me Argentina, <laughs> and of course uh, blame it in Rio, and you can see some economists on behalf of their country do the extra hard yards to help build bilateral relationships. 
So that's the world as an airport economist. What I've noticed, though, that in the long term, the trends between Australia and the Asian region that took off from the 1950s, from the Japan-Australia Commercial Agreement, have been continuing, whereby we've now been able to replace what the professors call the tyranny of distance with the power of proximity. It seems that the great reforms that Bob Hawke and Paul Keating engineered and led in the 1990s to open up the Australian economy happened right at the right time for the growth of Asia and the Asia-Pacific century. If you look at a long term of, uh, of, uh, of uh, trading relationships, it's really been uh, recent years in which Asia has improved its share of, of, of Australia's exports, particularly in the resource sector. It's an interesting thing for Australia and China because Australia and China is really a big part of that story. There was a great Chinese scholar who said that if it ever became a war or a battle or a competition between the West and the East, between Asia and the rest, it would be like a war between the mammals, uh, between the birds and, and, and the animals. And Australia would be like a bat, flying around but a mammal. And Peter Harcher from the Sydney Morning Herald said, we're more like a platypus. We can be a, mas we can be a mammal, but we can lay eggs. And uh, we've actually been able to deal with the rise of the Asian century very effectively. Interestingly, when you look at data and the long term of data, the growth of China as an economic partner, trade-wise, has really been a late 20th century phenomenon, as you can see the Westpac graph here with the red line shooting up just in the last couple of decades. But China's influence in Australia goes way back to the 19th century, particularly to the gold rushes and particularly to the development of the retail sector in Australia. A lot of the Chinese migrants that came to Australia in the 1850s, and one in nine Australian males were Chinese in 1850. Many of the Chinese migrants went back to Shanghai and to Guangzhou and set up the department stores, the retail emporiums that had actually begun in Australia. So the retail ties, commercial ties between Australia and China go way back before the great iron ore resource contracts of the late 20th century. However, we had some setbacks. In Federation, there were changes to tariffs and immigration that uh, harmed our relationships. Despite that, in a early Republican move, the Australian government back in the 1920s set up our first commercial office in Shanghai. The British weren't too happy about this. They thought Australia should only use the British commercial system, but we set up uh, an office in Shanghai in the 30s in Tokyo, and then in Batavia in Jakarta in the 1930s. So Australia had a very early push into Asia before uh, World War II. However, the Shanghai office didn't last too long and war and depression uh, interrupted that. Uh, we had the revolution and it wasn't until 1971 when Gough Whitlam made that very brave decision to go to Peking, to go to Beijing. If you think about it, 1949 was the last Labor Prime Minister, Ben Shifley. They were thinking of recognising the People's Republic in the 40s. They lost the election in 1949. So it wasn't until Gough Whitlam returned under the Labor banner 23, 23 years later that Australia had unfinished business where we finally recognised China. Gough made a very, uh, very courageous decision. Some economists, myself included, have been very tough on Gough Whitlam in terms of his interest in economics, but his diplomatic decision to recognise China was probably the most significant economic decision that any Prime Minister has made in Australia's recent economic history, so we've got him to thank for that. As a result, every political leader since Gough has had to have a very strong relationship with China uh, right up until the present. I have to keep changing these slides because Australian Prime Ministers turn over a lot quicker uh, than, than, they, than they used to. And not only that, um, every Australian business leader, no matter how powerful and wealthy within Australia's borders, they've all had to deal in China in their own very special ways and that's been very, very important for them as well. Well now we've got the great disruption. 
and uh, in, in some ways that was bigger than Brexit and has very important economic impacts and Im impacts on, on, on education and, uh, and Im impacts on people flows throughout the world. I'll say this about Trump on trade. Um, it was really Bernie Sanders who ran the campaign against the TPP uh, well before anyone else. And I think one thing that we can say is no matter who was going to be elected president, the TPP was going to struggle. Trump has also said similar things about NAFTA now and has been uh, tussling with Justin Trudeau and his Mexican counterpart. I think there's three things to say about Trump on trade. One is, he never says he's against trade, he just says America has done bad deals. And he is a businessman, he is the author of The Art of the Deal, so he can do a better deal. That's his main modus operandi. Secondly, he's spoken strongly against the Chinese on currency manipulation, so has nearly every Democratic president before him. So that's not a surprise, and I expect that Hillary Clinton, had she entered the White House, would have done so too. And finally, whilst Trump can do his trade policy on Twitter, ultimately trade policy is made in Congress. And uh, that's where the action is. I suspect that he is using the modern bully pulpit of Twitter, just as Teddy Roosevelt used to do, to basically intimidate American manufacturers, American employers to keep jobs in America so he can have some symbolic wins in Wisconsin, uh, in, uh, in Michigan, in those states that went to him. And with Janet Yellen's very careful steering of the American economy and the labour market, he will be able to take symbolic credit. So I think that's where most of his trade policy rhetoric is going. For us, I think the long-term trends will continue with respect to the Asian century. I think the power proximity is now replacing the Turian distance and Australia's connections to the Asian century are very important. But I think there's two areas where Australia can take a stronger stance internationally and domestically. One is with respect to the labour market. Robert Solow, the Nobel Prize winning professor of economics, always said the thing about the labour market is that the labour market is not like the market for dead fish. You cannot cut people's wages and conditions in the same way that you can change prices for fish in the fish market uh, in, in Piermont. For that reason, it's very important to keep trade issues away from labour market issues. I did some research when uh, I came to the University of New South Wales based on my research at the ACT, at the trade unions where I worked, and Austrade, that showed that exporters paid better wages, provided better health and safety, better employment security, better equal opportunity for women, and better education for its employees. They're also more likely to be unionised. So I actually thought it was important that the labour movement support an open economy and that we keep things like labour migration, 457 visas, out of formal trade agreements. And I think that's where perhaps we made some technical errors in having labour market issues brought into chapter where you can actually say to the Australian people, trade with China has been never been better for employment and for good jobs and good wages. And in many ways, I think Australia's had very good labour market institutions and we've been able to open up our economy and provide pretty reasonable social protections. Something that didn't occur in the United States and that's perhaps why populism, like that uh, proposed by Trump, have been popular. Uh, because it's been easy for Trump to blame NAFTA and the TPP or its economic relationship to China when in fact the erosion of labour market institutions in the United States where 90% of Americans haven't had a real wage rise since, uh, uh, since 1990 have been the real problem, not related to trade. Finally, I think we can make a very strong case for immigration. The disruption that Trump has caused with immigration will be very bad, uh, not only for people travelling themselves, it will be very bad for cooperation with universities in terms of research and development. Our university vice-chancellor made a very strong statement of the importance of research and development across borders and how that would, uh, would impact that. 
But um, it's also an important message for Australians to remember. When we look at the Australian population today, one in four Aussies is born overseas. One in two of our exporters is born overseas. Two thirds of our entrepreneurs in Australia are born overseas. So immigration has worked very, very well, uh, not only for society, but it's been a very much a very important part of growing our export base and growing our pool of entrepreneurial human capital. When you look at the great signs in Australia today, if you go around, you look at Westfield, you look at Bingley, many of those enterprises were started up by people that came here with no capital and often no English. And they built very, very important enterprises that employed the rest of us. And indeed, um, a lot of the Chinese migrants that have come here uh, since 1989 have not only built big, great businesses here in Australia, but they've also gone back to China and built uh, very, very strong bilateral ties between Australia and China, which have benefited both countries. So I think it's important that uh, in a time of populism that we remember that open markets and being open to people has been very good for Australia, but also very good for the world. If you look at um, the share of the world population living in absolute poverty since 1981, it was around 43% in 1981. Uh, now it's around 10%. And why is, that, why is that the case? Because we've had open markets. Why is that the case? Because China has been able to provide one of the world's greatest anti-poverty programs in human history. And I expect that uh, China's commitment to globalisation is because of its great commitment to providing opportunities for its people uh, through international trade and international commerce. Now, um, immigration has been good for the world. It's been good for Australia. It's also been good for me. I told you before that um, uh, my ancestors came from Transylvania and came here to be Bondi Beach Lifesavers. Well, this is my family today. My, uh, my wife is American of uh, Sicilian and Mongolian and Norwegian descent. My daughter is uh, from Guilin uh, in China and my son is from Taiwan. So together, we have a very comprehensive free trade agreement uh, <laughs> across different borders. And that's why I think uh, Australia needs to be open to trade, open to investment, open to ideas and open to people. And that's why we'll have a lot of blue sky ahead, just like at Bondi Beach. Thank you.